Hi, Facebook Live. I know that uh, I can see there's already some of you here. Um, so I'm going to start in just a minute here. Um, what this is, uh, this is a teaching we're doing for um, adults and parents associated with the uh, Lecture GSA, Gender, Sexual, yeah, Gender Sexuality and Allies Youth Group, um, and uh, trying to provide some resources, biblical and theological, for questions of gender and sexuality as they relate to um, the Bible and stuff like that. So I do have... Um, the live stream up on my phone. So if you have questions, hi, Laura Lopez. Congratulations on being pregnant, girl. That's fantastic. Twins, twins. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Um, Bethany wants very much to have deets on uh, baby shower when that's known. So um, yeah, awesome. Um, so I'm going to try really hard not to get distracted by uh, Laura here, Laura there. And everything, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dive right in because this is a lot of content to cover. So I'm gonna do my best. And if people wind up joining late, they join late. People join online, they join online. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them though. Um, so the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, lofty origin of all being. Graciously let a ray of your brilliance penetrate into the darkness of my understanding and take from me the double darkness in which I have been born and obscurity of both sin and ignorance. Give me a sharp sense of understanding, a retentive memory and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, this is a prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas before study, and it's something that's very important to me. Actually, I first encountered it. It was a gift um, that was printed on a, a, port, uh, a print given to me by one of my deeply uh, important mentors, Father Bob Hart. Um, who gave it to me uh, to kind of guide me as a priest. And I have it in my office hanging above my filing cabinet. And it always um, strikes me as meaningful. Um, so I thought it'd be a good way for us to begin um, because so much of study um, really is about learning. And one of the things I think is unfortunate about the way we exist in the world right now, particularly in the church, um, is everyone thinks they already know. And very few times do people approach a subject with the, ability, the idea that they're actually going to learn something new. Um, and particularly when you're dealing with difficult questions like questions of gender, sexuality in the Bible and in scripture um, and in theology, um, an, an attitude of curiosity uh, will be deeply helpful uh, for digging into these sorts of questions. So thanks for uh, giving me that. Uh, to begin with, oh, our, we're not on here. One second. I mean, just make sure I've got my projection suite up here. Shut off. This is a well-oiled machine. <laughs> there we go. Um, a theological principle at the start. Uh, this is a prayer. Uh, this is uh, St. Thomas of Kempis, if you're familiar with him. A 14th century, I believe, Christian author. Um, and uh, Imitation of Christ, Imitatio Christi, is really one of the foundational texts on Christian discipleship that's out there. Um, and this is the very beginning of Imitation of Christ, and it remains one of my favorite, favorite quotes in all of Christendom. What good does it do you to be able to give a learned discourse on the Trinity while you are without humility and thus are displeasing to the Trinity? Esoteric words neither make us holy nor righteous, only a virtuous life makes us beloved of God. I would rather experience repentance in my soul than know how to define it. Um, yeah, right. This is the stuff. Um, uh, and I think it's so important because we're doing a series in faith formation at my church right now on the early church called the, the patient ferment. One of the points the author of the patient ferment makes is in the first four centuries of the church, um, there are treatises on all kinds of subjects, catechetical manuals, guides. Um, there's not a single treatise on evangelism. They didn't teach people about evangelism. You look at catechetical guides, they have 130 things they teach catechumens in the church. They never teach them about how to share the gospel with unbelievers. What they teach them about is how to live faithfully, 
as people of love and, and meekness and gentleness, trusting in the hope of God, because that in the end is what's going to convert people to Christianity and the church. And I think that we've lost that in so many ways. Um, and so this reminder from Thomas Akempis, um, that no matter how good you are to describing, things, and I will say that's hard for me as someone that really likes to be good at describing things, but it's a good reminder that humility, love, meekness, mercy are what has to be uh, paramount. And we'll come back to that a little bit more at the end, I think, as well. Um, I've got kind of a fourfold path towards understanding the, these uh, questions that I'm going to take us on um, over the course of uh, this hour or so that we're going to be together. Um, we're going to look at some scriptural and theological foundations. I'm going to look at questions surrounding marriage and sexuality in the church. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the Episcopal Church's answer to these questions because we were asked to give an answer to these questions by the rest of the communion when we um, did some explicit changes to our discipline um, almost 20 years ago. And then uh, scriptural ammo that's out there diffused. So one of my, my favorite moments in a movie is, um, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of the movie? Um, uh, it's, it's flipping my mind at the moment, but it's this great scene uh, where a, uh, this kind of mean Christian kid is just being horrible to this um, kind of marginalized girl and, th and throws a Bible at her and the girl picks it up and says, this isn't supposed to be a weapon. And I remember watching that when I was in college and being like, oh, yes, this is not meant to be a weapon. So I'm going to take some of the scriptural ammo that's been out there that the church has thrown at people and try to see if we can't diffuse some of that. Um, I could maybe be, be MacGyver or MacGruber, depending on the skill with which I do it, you will have to decide for yourself. Um, so let's begin with scriptural and theological foundations. Hello, welcome, come on in. Uh, scriptural and theological foundations. This is a, a reading from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Uh, this is uh, the Confession of St. Peter, a text that occurs in several of the Gospels, um, and is often seen as one of the foundational texts for talking about the authority of the church to make pronouncements on matters of theology, discipline, morals, and the like, that binding that happens. For the Roman Catholic Church, they would understand this as being about the authority given to Peter as the first among the apostles that the Pope gets to bind and lose. Uh, but in the early church, this was more seen as the authority of the church writ whole, uh, not of Peter as a person, but as the church in terms of the whole community um, of, of the apostles. Um, but there's danger that goes with this. So first off, the rock upon which the church is built, um, we would say as Anglicans is not Peter himself, um, uh, but is actually Peter's confession, the idea that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is God, in, God incarnate. That that's the, what grounds us in the church. If the church is not grounded on the teachings of Jesus, then the church has nothing to stand upon. That's what has to ground us. And so whenever we talk about something, if you can, can, cannot connect it deeply to the life and, life and teachings of Jesus, then I'm not as interested in what you have to say. Um, so that has to be what grounds us. The keys given to the church, to the, this ability to bind and lose things, um, you can see that in a prescriptive way, um, that the church has the ability to say, you know, well, this is and this is not okay. But you can also see it in a descriptive way, that when the Christian community says, this is evil, if we don't say that accurately, we wound. When the church says, this is okay, even if it is actually evil, when we set something loose that needs to be bound, we wound. So it is an example of that. Um, when Christianity um, supported slavery and loosed that in the world, uh, we had, take it, it's yours. Um, when the church loosed that, we did great damage. The, the church has the power to bind things up and to lose things, and we have not always exercised that authority well. Um, and that means that we have to always be asking, is what we're binding what God, what God would have us to bind? Is what we're losing what God would have us to lose? Um, because there's profound danger to do not just harm to individuals, but harm to whole classes and societies of people. Um, so that's a, a, an important theological place from which to start. 
Um, and it's a particularly important because the church uh, has changed its mind about what it's going to bind and lose lots of times. I've just got six examples here I want to give you, but these are just six of a variety I could give you. So first off, uh, let's begin with ritual laws. Um, so of course the Bible, you know, you can't eat shrimp. Uh, you can't eat meat with the blood in it. If you ever go to Israel um, uh, and go to Burger King to get a cheese, I don't know why you'd be eating a cheeseburger in Israel. Number one, you're ordering the wrong sort of food. But if you do, they will not let, they won't serve it with cheese on it because of the, the rabbinic prohibition against a, a meat uh, boiled in its mother's milk. There's a danger that that could be happening. And so they don't do it. Um, so we don't worry about that in Christianity anymore, right? We've set those ritual laws aside, prohibitions against short pork, shellfish, the wearing of garments of mixed composition. I think this is probably cotton and polyester of some sort, right? Lord knows every set of skinny jeans out there is definitely not one type of fabric. So we kind of set those aside. The church has said that those ritual laws in the Bible don't really apply. So we kind of, we've loosed uh, the, the strictures surrounding that. Um, law of Sabbath. So a, a rabbi um, asked a friend of mine once, why do you Christians think the Ten Commandments apply to you? And if so, why don't you keep the Sabbath? Which is hilarious. All of these Christians want to put the Ten Commandments on courthouses and in the, in the front of buildings. Um, th those aren't for you. Like, we're not like, do they understand that right? And if you do think they're for you, then why are you working on Saturday, right? Um, or even if you slide that to the way Christians then reinterpreted the Sabbath as, oh, well, then that's Sunday, the Lord's Day. Uh, blue laws are out, right? You could, I remember in Ottawa County growing up, I, where you could go and you, you could order um, a whiskey, but not a beer, because the blue laws were so ridiculous in Ottawa County um, when I was a kid, right? But blue laws are out, so Christians don't really keep the Sabbath. It's hard enough for me as a priest to get people to show up at church on Sunday, much less set aside the entire day as a day of rest. So clearly, we, as a church, have allowed there to be change in our understanding of that teaching, even though that teaching is foundational to the Ten Commandments, the most important set of laws in the entirety of the Hebrew scripture, we kind of wiggle around it. So that's, that, this idea that we, well, we never change our mind is clearly, you're going to see, doesn't work. Um, the Jerusalem Council. So um, the first council of the church is described in Acts 15. Uh, the issue being uh, that we've got Gentiles who are in the church. We, we feel like they should probably be Jews because you have to be a Jew to be saved. But now people are telling us that they don't think that we should make them Jews. So what do we do? And they kind of, this council comes up with an idea of what they're going to say to Gentile Christians. And it's not they have to become Jewish because the, the, our mind has changed on that. Instead, they say, well, um, you just have to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, sexual immorality, and eating meat with blood in it, um, which is, as someone who loves a good medium rare steak, a depressing idea, but that's kind of the compromise they struck to keep some of the Jewish teachings, but not all of them for new Gentile converts. Um, so once again, they decided to lose some stuff while binding some other stuff upon Gentile converts. Um, the problem is, is that after that, St. Paul disagrees with the Jerusalem Council. In 1 Corinthians 18, Paul says, we all know idols aren't real. So if you eat meat sacrificed an idol, it's not going to hurt anything. So it's fine. But if it could wound your weaker sibling in Christ, maybe just don't do it in front of them so you don't freak them out. So Paul is disagreeing with the definitive statement of the first council of the church, but is also urging them to nuance it. And notice how Paul is urging them to nuance their understanding of ethics, the way in which it's going to affect your sibling in Christ, particularly the weaker person in the community. That should be what governs, not what these people in authority have said is right or wrong, but what's going to actually have an impact upon the life of the person near you. That's what Paul is saying. It's kind of his own personal approach to that. Do you all remember Ursary? You probably are very worried about the sin of Ursary, right? Probably a lot of you don't know what Ursary is, I would imagine. Ursary is lending money at interest. Ursary was a sin for 1,500 years of the church. The early church was clear. To lend someone money and charge interest is wrong because you are making money off of people's poverty. Um, it's described in Ezekiel as an abomination, the exact same word to describe homosexuality, well, supposedly homosexuality in the Hebrew scriptures, toiba. In patristic thought, it's described as an unnatural thing to do. 
the same word they use in some patristic writers to talk about same-sex relationships. It's unnatural. They're saying Ursary is the same thing. But the fascinating thing is what happens. You get to around the 15th, 16th century, 16th century, John Calvin, and they're like, well, but you know, we could maybe make society function a little better if we had a little interest. And so literally the church just gave up. Stop taking it seriously. Now, some of these you might disagree with. I think maybe the idea of saying lending money interest is fine was perhaps a bad idea um, because it may have built the society we have right now, but it has become another form of slavery for some people. So it's not, I'm not saying every time the church loses something, they do it right. I think the church losing ursary upon the upon religious people and saying, go at it was probably the church screwing this loosing up a bit. But the point is, no one is up here talking about a biblical understanding of interest. <laughs> no one is really upset about that. No one is campaigning for the Supreme Court to change the laws, to get rid of interest in our society, even though the Bible, Judaism, and the church consistently said this was wrong for centuries. So once again, things change, we bind, we lose differently as society develops. And as well, we, there are, I could go on, slavery, divorce. We went from supporting slavery, literally, we were the ones that said slavery was okay. Um, a lot of the foundations for Christians' understanding of slavery came from the Pope and from other religious leaders who gave theological reasons why it is okay to enslave Africans. This was a Christian thing that was thought of. Um, uh, so we developed, hopefully, right? Um, of course, at this point, I would not say I know we developed, for sure, given the views some Christians have on race relations, but I would hope that we've developed on these questions to say, slavery is not okay. Uh, the question of divorce, in, in our Anglican tradition, we began allowing divorce after remarriage around 100 years ago. Um, other Christian traditions, a lot of them towards the middle to the second part of the 20th century, decided that to tell someone who's gone through the trauma of a divorce um, that they have to either go back to a traumatic and broken relationship or live their life alone is probably a cruel thing probably doesn't reflect the love of God and the love of Christ. And so maybe there's a different way. And so the church found a merciful approach. How is it that we found a merciful approach for that and not gay and lesbian Christians? Probably because of all of the people in leadership in the church who got divorced, the, it, right? As opposed to all of the gay Christians in leadership, right? Who, there's a thing here going on that we tend to bind and lose as it suits us. So we have to be very, we have to be really acknowledge that. Like I said, not all of these are clearly right or wrong. Sometimes the church is bound in places it should have set things loose. Sometimes the church has set things loose and really it was wrong. We should have bound that thing up. But we have to ask ourselves, careful questions about what it means for the church to make these decisions and to place these upon other people, remembering that if Jesus is the rock of the church, Jesus' number one criticism of the religious people in his own time was you tie burdens on the back of people and you're unwilling to lift a finger to help them. And I really believe that's something the church has done to our LGBTQIA Christians, is that it has tied burdens upon their back and has been unwilling to do anything to lift a finger to help them. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So, theological foundations. Matthew, a little more Matthew, a little bit later on, chapter 22. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which of the commandment in the which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like, like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Um, this, I think, I deeply believe, is the lens we're called to look through as Christians when it comes to all of these questions. Love of God and love of neighbor. Every law, every statement of the church, every action must be measured against this requirement. That's what Jesus tells us. All the law and the prophets hang on this. Is what you're doing, is what you're saying advancing love of God and love of neighbor, or is it not? If a concept, an idea, isn't advancing love of God and neighbor, then the heart and meaning has been lost and must be recovered. Um, love of God and love of neighbor has to be the heart. So anything in the church, if I can't tie it to that, 
then I need to reconsider because this is the exact lens Jesus used when interpreting the Bible for religious people in his own time. Constantine said, yeah, the Bible may say this, but I tell you this. And every time he did that was because love of God and love of neighbor had been missed in contemporary religious practice. So this has to be the foundation with which we operate on these questions. <sighs> questions, anything so far? Anyone online questions? I see I've got you there. No, then we will push on. Let's talk about marriage and sexuality in the church. This is uh, the second path we're taking. Uh, the sacrament of marriage. Um, this is uh, from the Declaration of Intention. This is a statement that every um, uh, person who wants to get married in the Episcopal Church must sign um, to get on the calendar, to get in the, in the canons, to get married here. Uh, God's purpose for our marriage is for our mutual joy, for the help and comfort we will give to each other in prosperity and adversity, and when it is God's will for the gift and heritage of children and their nurture and the knowledge and love of God, we also understand our marriage is to be unconditional, mutual, exclusive, faithful, and lifelong. Now, this is my own denomination way of describing marriage. I would say probably most Christians would say, yeah, sure. Like, that sounds good. This is a, a lovely description of marriage. Um, what we need to know is this is not what the church has always thought marriage was. And I'm not just talking about same-sex marriage. The ideals and values here that most Christians today would affirm have not been universal for all time in the church. So let's dig into this a little bit here. I want to recover a biblical understanding of marriage. Ha! I don't want to under, uh, recover a biblical understanding of marriage because I'm pretty sure if I did, my wife would leave me. Uh, so let's talk about a biblical understanding of marriage. Um, St. Paul didn't really like marriage. He said, you know, really, you should be celibate. You should devote yourself to, but if you're going to burn with lust, fine, you can get married. Um, there, he, what fascinating is Paul preferred celibacy, but even Paul, Mr. I don't really like marriage a lot, didn't believe it was appropriate to force celibacy on any person. That was inappropriate for the church to do that. Marriage is permitted for those who couldn't be celibate in Paul's mind. Um, uh, Paul also believed Jesus was probably coming back in the next 10 or 20 years. That's why he thought he could pull it off. Uh, to be honest, 10 or 20 years seems like a long time for me anyways. But sure, Paul, whatever you say, point being, Paul's not a big fan of marriage. Um, but it gets even more difficult than that because of what Paul said is a change. Of course, under older biblical laws, a man was permitted to have multiple wives or concubines if you want, kind of I don't give her the benefit of calling her a wife, but you can still kind of have her when you want her, right? Uh, adultery in older biblical law was defined as having sex with someone else's wife. It wasn't about what the man did unless it was with someone else's property. That's what made it adultery. You want to have multiple wives, you want to have concubines, that's fine. In fact, prostitution was allowed. For certain, it was, it was okay in scripture for prostitution to exist is an outlet for men because you know men apparently they need help. Um, it was not seen as a moral failing until the last couple hundred years before Christ was, was when Jewish leaders started thinking maybe prostitution isn't what religious people should be doing. I don't agree with that, but I want to acknowledge this is the worldview of the Bible when it comes to marriage, okay? Polygamy wasn't really rejected at all in biblical times, right? We all know Abraham, David, Solomon, they all had many wives. Nowhere does someone say, hey, maybe that wasn't a good idea. It's the, 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 that's absent from the text. It wasn't until rabbinic Judaism and the Qumran sects that we begin to see people saying, maybe polygamy is less than ideal. Maybe, you know, a monogamous relationship is better. Um, but it wasn't even impermissible in Judaism until the 10th century AD was when it was finally laid out as an explicit law for all time going forward, we don't do polygamy. So once again, biblical understanding of marriage, maybe. Um, Jesus, of course, changed our understanding of marriage as well. Jesus was part of the growing teaching of his own time, which extended adultery to men violating their own marriages. So for Jesus, he would say you're committing adultery, not just if you have someone else's property, but as a man, if you look lustfully on another woman, you're committing adultery in your own heart. Even a man having sex with a woman who wasn't right wasn't really adultery in the times before Christ. Jesus 
is tightening down on the expectations he has for men, so much so that he's not even concerned about what they do with women who aren't their wives. He's concerned about what they have in their hearts and in their minds for women who aren't their wives. So Jesus is changing and shifting understandings of marriage. Um, in the early church, early Christians accepted uh, the Roman rule and the growing uh, Jewish ideal of monogamy. Uh, they kind of, they frowned upon concubines and divorce, but that was really a lot more so because of what Roman philosophers at the time believed. More or less, uh, more Roman philosophers at the time, particularly Stoicism, were, were beginning to believe that monogamy was better, divorce, all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's where the early church was kind of coming from. That, but when the early church was having these ideas, it was growing out of this kind of mess that you can see is in a biblical view of marriage. So let's talk about a Christian view of marriage if we're going to talk about the church. Um, so in the ancient world, marriages are arranged by the parents for the transfer of property. That's what marriage is. It's, it, it, it's a largely familial, community, legal transfer. That's what it is. Uh, in the early church, as we said, celibacy was preferred and marriage, when it did happen, was a family affair. You didn't go to your local house church for a marriage service where someone read 1 Corinthians 13, and then you all had cake. That was not what marriage looked like in the early church. In fact, most marriages in the early church were probably common law marriages, where there was no ceremony involved. People just lived together but long enough that people are like, eh, this is marriage. We're together now. Um, that's the way it was in the early church. In fact, it wasn't until the ninth century that there exists a liturgy for marriage in the church. How bizarre for people who think this is so central to the church's teaching. It, in that ninth century liturgy, by the way, is identical to what the ancient Roman liturgy was, the ancient Roman pagan liturgy, just sticking Jesus and God into it. Um, it's not even anything distinctively Christian, right? Um, it's the 12th century before marriage is established as a sacrament of the church. So clearly, this is not actually fundamental to what we believe as Christians, right? Uh, moving on to the 16th century, it, that was when the church started saying, maybe we should make sure people are married. The church didn't care. It didn't require evidence that you were married to someone. That, was, that wasn't the church's business, they thought. But in the 16th century, they start requiring that. And it wasn't until the 1970s that we stopped to see actual equality in marriage. Remembering, of course, uh, before the 1970s, a woman could open a credit card in her own name in a lot of states in our country. Um, it wasn't really until the 1970s that you'd started to say a wife could consent or not consent to sex. Marital rape was still legal in our country. Um, so we want to talk about a Christian understanding of marriage. It has evolved, and I think we've gotten a little bit better. I personally much prefer our understanding of marriage today based on mutual consent, love, sacrifice, much more to the more ancient ways marriage is practiced in the Christian church. So maybe an evolving sense of marriage isn't a bad thing because maybe what we are evolving toward is God's dream for what we actually should look like in our societies. Questions, thoughts. All right. So let's talk about the Episcopal Church's answer to these questions. Um, in 2003, our church consecrated Gene Robinson as the first openly gay bishop in the Catholic tradition of the church. Uh, this was in contrast to the views of most provinces of the Anglican Communion. And so the Anglican Communion kind of like, why? You know, why have you done this thing? They asked us to provide a theological rationale for this change. And so we did, and we produced this book, which is To Set Our Hope in Christ. A response to the invitation of the Windsor Report, paragraph 135. Fun point of note, one of the authors of this book, theologian, the Reverend Dr. J. Johnson, this past year became the rector of All Saints Episcopal Church in Saugatuck. So you got a little Episcopal famous star in your, I only knew him on Zoom uh, for the most of last year. First time I saw him in person, I was he's a very tall man. Uh, but Jay Johnson was one of the people that helped write this. Jay is definitely not watching this. If he was, though, uh, Jay, uh, I'm just fanning out on you, little boy here, fanboy. So. This is one of the things that it says in To Set a Hope in Christ. And remember, this was in 2003. So when it says for 40 years, now you're talking 60 years in the Episcopal Church. For almost 40 years, members of the Episcopal Church have discerned holiness and same-sex relationships and have come to support the blessing of such unions and the ordination or consecration of persons in those unions. 
Christian congregations have sought to celebrate and bless same-sex unions because these exclusive lifelong unions of fidelity and care for each other have been experienced as holy. We started asking ourselves these questions. So this would be what, this would be, I do my math here in the 60s, right? In the mid 60s, we started asking ourselves these questions. And we said, you know what? These relationships seem holy. We can't see what it is that would make this not holy other than that they happen to be two boys or two girls. Um, and in the same way that a few decades ago, we looked at the question of interracial marriage and thought these are holy relationships, even if a person is black and this person's white, why does that make it wrong? The relationship is holy. They're saying it's the same thing that the same experience that they had that we had as Episcopalians when it came to um, these relationships. Um, and to set our hope in Christ does more than that. Um, it, it describes in the course of this small book, uh, it's about to read the book itself and ignore the appendix, you're going to get to about 70 pages. It's, and it's not 70 pages of significant heavy lifting, but it's good stuff. So I'm, I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version here. Uh, it's an experience of the Spirit's gifts, like I said, is what we said we saw here. Um, and we used Acts 10 as our foundational text. In Acts 10, Peter visited the household of Cornelius, a righteous Gentile, um, to you know, kind of bring them the good news. While he was still preaching, the Holy Spirit thought he was taking too long, poured the Holy Spirit out upon the Gentile Christians, uh, the Gentile um, uh, household, and Peter was like, well, apparently there's nothing to prevent these people from being Christians, and so I should probably baptize them. The Spirit's been poured out upon them. Maybe my understanding here was wrong. This is contrary to Scripture. Contrary to tradition, they had always believed you have to become a Jew to be a part of the people of God. This is contrary to everything Peter had believed his entire life, but he could not deny the presence of the Spirit in the household of Cornelius, and so he changed his mind. Their experience caused them to re-examine how they interpreted scripture. And I want to lean on that point, because a lot of time when I talk to Christians who struggle with these questions, they, they, they know what they've always been told the Bible says, but it does not resonate with their experience of gay people. Doesn't. Doesn't resonate with their experience of transgender people. These people seem lovely. They seem holy. They seem committed to the common good, to one another. I don't know why this can be what the Bible says. It doesn't make sense. So that kind of, now what some Christians will say, well, you just got to trust the Bible, you gotta trust the Bible. Um, uh, what Peter would say is, well, maybe you should trust the Holy Spirit within you because it's the Holy Spirit within you that is saying, no, this is not okay. In the same way that Peter had to trust the Holy Spirit in him saying no, and not even the Holy Spirit in him, the Holy Spirit in them telling him, no, this is not what God intends for God's people. Uh, we, as Episcopalians, have seen the fruits of Christian marriage in the lives of our same-sex couples um, in many ways. And I will say that very honestly, as a priest, um, a lot of the same-sex couples I know, their marriages are better than the straight marriages I know. Um, partially, that's because of the adversity they've experienced throughout their lives together, has bound them together in a particular way. Um, there's a willingness to give and commit to the other, which I often find absent in opposite-sex couples. Um, it kind of takes all of those issues of gender roles that, you know, husbands and wives fight about and turns a lot of them on their head. Um, though in some ways you find other things to fight about because in the end, what I've discovered as a priest working with opposite sex and same sex couples is marriage is marriage is marriage. And no matter the sex of the people involved, marriage is marriage. But the point being that we've seen holiness, not just the same struggles that we all share, but holiness in the lives of same-sex couples, and we can't ignore that gift of the Spirit. So in the same way that Peter and others told their stories to the rest of the church, um, they listened. The church came to a new understanding of what it meant to be a part of the people of God. Um, at the same time, this remained the, the dominant, dominant debate of the first century church. A significant portion of the New Testament is about the question of the inclusion of Gentiles into the church. Um, and most New Testament scholars would agree with you on that. So, for example, take the, the letter of Paul to the Romans. Uh, you probably have been told the letter of Paul to the Romans is about how we're all saved by grace through faith. No. The letter of Paul to the Romans is Paul writing to a church in Rome where the Jewish Christians were expelled during a time of persecution. The church then became overwhelmingly Gentile. And when the Jewish Christians came back, 
the church didn't look like their church anymore. It's all different, all these Gentile questions, and they're fighting with each other. That's why Paul is talking to them about the fact that you're saved by grace, so that Jewish Christians will stop judging Gentile Christians, so that Gentile Christians will stop judging Jewish Christians, and that instead we can all rely upon the grace that saves us. He was doing that to solve the question of inclusion that the church was wrestling with in the very first century. Um, and a lot of the questions as you look through the New Testament, is the church wrestling with this? And even Peter, bless Peter's heart, bless Peter's heart, who you know, gets this moment of the Holy Spirit in Acts 10. Later, Paul has to confront Peter because Peter's refusing to eat with Gentiles, to have table fellowship with them, because it's not like what people say when they see him at you know, drag brunch in downtown Grand Haven. Uh, I don't want people to judge me or think less of me. And Paul calls him out. It says, this is not what we believe as Christians. These are your brothers in Christ, and you will sit down to have a meal with them. So there's a growing change here, but it was a hard change to make. It's so in the same way that for some Christians today, this is a hard change to make. The church has been doing hard stuff like this since we began. And the spirit has been pushing us to do hard things like this since we began. But the Bible says, this is whatever, but the Bible says so clearly, the Bible says, the Bible says. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the Bible does and doesn't say. Uh, I'm going to start with Ezra, which is where you all, I'm sure, go when you get to these questions. Uh, the book of Ezra and Ezra 10, the men of Israel are commanded to divorce their foreign wives, who are seen to be a danger to the faithfulness of Israel. Put away your foreign wives. Very, very serious argument made in the book of Ezra. Huge part of the Bible, Ezra 10. Uh, written around the same time is another book you may have heard of, the book of Ruth. Um, probably written about the same time, Ruth, a Moabite, who marries Boaz, who is an Israelite, and is praised. Boaz as, is seen as having acted faithfully in marrying Ruth the Moabite. And she is literally called Ruth the Moabite like 500 times in the book of Ruth. Oh, every time it's, it's Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, over and over and over again, Boaz is praised. And they point out at the end of the book of Ruth that King David is descended from Ruth the Moabite. So what you're seeing here is the Bible arguing with itself about the question of foreign wives. Some Jewish people at the time believe we have to get rid of these foreign wives, we have to keep Israel pure. Others believe, no, King David's grandmother was a Moabite. That can't be what faithfulness looks like. So just because the Bible says something, because it exists somewhere in scripture, cannot solve the question for us. We have to look more deeply than that. We need to do what is called, of course, interpretation. Our faithful response, anytime we have a question in the Bible, the Bible says something, is to ask, okay, in what book? When was that written? What were the circumstances? What are the reasons given? Do those same reasons apply in the same way in our own situation? These are the interpretive questions we must ask. And, of course, that we do ask. I don't know a single Christian who takes the Bible actually literally. Everyone does interpretive moves with the Bible, trying to understand how it applies best in our own time. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take some of that ammo that's been thrown at people and just diffuse it a little bit um, with the notorious six. Yeah, I don't like them either, Kennedy. I agree. The notorious six, as I like to call them. Uh, we'll begin. Oh, that got a little small, but I will read it to you. Don't worry. We'll begin with uh, Genesis 19 and Judges 19. Um, this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So let's be clear. This is the story of the attempted rape of angelic guests in Sodom and Gomorrah which Ezekiel 16 describes the sin of Sodom in this way, that Sodom had pride, excess of food, prosperous seas, but did not aid the poor and the needy. The sin of Sodom was a sin of hospitality to the immigrant. The angelic visitors were strangers. Ancient world believes that when a, when a strange person, an immigrant crosses into your household, you take care of them. They believe that because if everyone doesn't do that in the ancient world, in the desert society, we will all die. So everyone has to know when an immigrant comes, someone crosses it, you take care of them. So when the men of Sodom want to take these angelic visitors and rape them, that is a violation of the deepest commitments of the ancient world. And clearly it wasn't about the sex of the visitors because Lot thinks they'll be happy by getting his daughters instead, right? So clearly that's not what's going on here. So that's the sin described in Genesis 19 and Judges 19 as interpreted by the Bible itself. So let's go ahead. If you want to use that to say, you know, homosexuality is wrong, you got to toss that one out the window. Does it work? Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. Uh, these texts are from what's known as the Holiness Code, which is concerned with boundary crossings between Israel and the surrounding nations. Um, 
Uh, so this is saying, you know, we are not going to be like other nations, so we're going to live our lives differently. Um, other things that we're going to do to do that is we're not going to eat shrimp, not going to trim the sides of our beard, stuff like that. I'm guessing no one's worried about that today. I personally don't eat shrimp. It is the cockroach of the sea and it is terrifying, but my wife eats it and I do not judge her for that. I will not eat it myself, but I do not judge her. I trimmed the sides of my beard yesterday. I look much better than with scruffy Jared. So these are holiness codes written for, and it's not that they don't count. And so I don't mean to make light of them. In the ancient world is the tribal people of Israel who were most likely a nomadic federation of tribes wandering. They had to find a way to make themselves different. So when you look at the holiness code, think of it in the way you think of immigrant communities in our own world, in our own nation who develop customs, ways of eating, ways of dress, that give them a sense of identity so that they can survive as a marginalized people in an oppressive culture. That's what these codes were meant to do, is to bind the community together, not to be used 3,000 years later to attack gay people. That's not what they're for. Uh, the, I, I agree, totally, Kennedy's there, excellent biblical scholar. Uh, so let's, some New Testament stuff. Uh, so that's three we're gone through. First Corinthians chapter six and first Timothy 10. These are both texts that can list a, a list of vices that you shouldn't have among Christianity. Uh, one word they use in these malakoi seems to refer most likely to young male prostitutes or victims of pederasty, to be honest. Um, the other word, arsenokotai, is likely shorthand for the Levitical rules uh, that we just talked about. So what you're seeing here is a couple things. First, you're seeing a rejection of the dehumanization systems of oppression that existed in Greek culture um, between older men and younger boys. Um, a lot of people think Greek culture was very much a fan of, of homosexuality. It wasn't, it didn't like older men being together um, because how, why would a man debase himself by being the submissive person in a sexual act? Um, boys are, are okay though. So this was the church saying that power and balance is, some, is wrong, okay? The other thing that they're saying is they're still struggling with these Levitical laws, like we saw Peter are struggling with, like we see Paul struggling with. So what, what part of these Levitical laws count? Do we eat food sacrificed to idols? I don't know. Do we eat meat with blood in it? Acts 15 says no. Later, Paul says yes. So you're seeing what the early church is doing is trying to figure out how do we re-understand this part of our tradition in light of this world we're living in with Gentile Christians. So I think that's what you're seeing going on here. The big one though people always wanna jump up and down about is Romans chapter one, where Paul talks about people letting go of what's natural to claim what's unnatural. So to note here, what Paul is doing, he's writing up about what he believes to be natural compared to what is unnatural. Elsewhere, Paul also says it is unnatural for men to have long hair, but it is natural for women to do that. Given every picture I have seen of Jesus in church, that seems a little bizarre, but okay. I know when I wore my hair down to my shoulders, my wife, after I cut it off, said, thank God that was unnatural. But I also know that many men look lovely with long hair and many women look lovely with shorter hair. We don't think that's a question of what's natural anymore, even though Paul did, right? We can recognize, well, Paul was saying that he's a product of his time, right? It's the same thing here. Furthermore, Paul has no conceptualization of what, what is natural when it comes to sexuality or gender. He's not a scientist. He can't figure that out. Paul would have believed as a first century Jewish man that what happens when a man and a woman are together is that the man puts the embryo in the woman. He didn't know that you need an egg and a sperm to fertilize to make an embryo. That's what they thought was going on. So I don't know why we're taking Paul's advice on this sort of thing. Paul is not a scientist, right? Um, he, he's not. And so he, he, what he's rejecting, all that to say, what he's rejecting is those who are choosing sexual adventure over the created nature of God. Fascinating. So if we would understand now that a certain percentage of the population are naturally gay, for example, and we tell those people to be in sexual relationships with people of the opposite sex, even though it's contrary to everything about how God has created them, then we are violating what Paul said because we are forcing them to go against the way God has created them to do what we think they should be doing as opposed to being true to who God, how God has created them to be. 
So the ironic thing about Romans 1, I think, is Romans 1 is a great argument in favor of gay and lesbian Christians when you read it according to what we know is naturally true. The actual things being condemned in these notorious six passages have nothing to do with contemporary questions surrounding same-sex relationships. And furthermore, one cannot insist they do unless you're gonna ignore the historical context of the verses, the way they're interpreted, the way they're understood within scripture, uh, and also, unless you apply that same interpretation equally to questions of slavery, polygamy, earthly, a host of issues where understanding and interpretation of scripture has developed. Um, you can't use these six clobber passages in that way. Furthermore, the church, the, the Bible talks about this six times, about 400 times it talks about the way you spend your money when it comes to the poor. I yet to see people jump up and down about that in the church. And that's what we actually should be jumping up and down about in the church, particularly right now in our own time with rampant um, economic and income inequality. But I digress. All right. I want to step back from sexuality questions because this is a GSA group. This is about gender and sexuality. And let's talk a little bit about gender identity, right? Which doesn't get nearly as much conversation. And, and, and you know, same, the, the, the gift of same-sex marriage in our country is amazing. It's wonderful. Marriage equality has been a great gift. But the transgender community is still profoundly marginalized um, in, our, in, our, in our country. And so we need to talk seriously about this as Christians, theologically and biblically. Um, first off, one of the things people often think of is they talk, well, God you know, created male and female in God's image. This is my impression of some Christians, apparently, male and female in God's image. Um, and so uh, like, they're opposites, right? There's like, you've got male and female. So clearly this is the way that you know, it works. Uh, uh, so when that's described in Genesis 1, it's the same way that God creates night and day, land and sea, flying birds, swimming fish. Um, it's poetry. You all have poetry? You take two opposites and you place them together to describe a whole, right? Uh, but we do know that the world isn't binary, right? We know that there's not just night and day, that there's dusk, there's dawn. We know we've got penguins that can't fly, but they can swim, and dolphins that can shoot into the air. None of God's creation clearly fits into binary boxes of this or that. Instead, all of these things we see are part of the delight of diversity in God's creation. There's nothing cooler than watching a penguin shimmy down into the water and swim away. And when we see that, we don't say, that's not how God created fit, uh, birds. God created birds to fly. We don't say that. We say, how cool, God created some birds to swim. How cool is that? That's because God delights in diversity. There's a spectrum of reality in God's creation. Um, and identity as well. God continually gives people new names and new identities over and over again, affirming that who and what you are called can be about proclaiming a new realization of your identity, not what your parents thought you were at birth. Abram and Sarai were named that by their parents. He gave them new names, Abraham and Sarah. Jacob is renamed Israel, someone who wrestled with God. In Matthew, Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter, Petros, not rock, little pebble right? This is what God does. God gives people new identities. And God says, you know, sometimes the identity that your parents gave you is not who I called you to be. And you get to claim that. You get to own that. And we're going to honor that. The Episcopal Church actually at our last general convention approved a new liturgy for the claiming of a new name when somebody transitions in gender identity. And it's an amazing liturgy because the liturgy is steeped in these stories of scripture. I don't know how anyone could go through that liturgy with a transgender person and deny that this is somehow foreign to the Bible. This is rooted in our biblical understanding of identity as God gives it to us as a gift. Um, even though Deuteronomy 23 outlawed units in society, explicit law in the Bible, Bible says so, I believe that that settles it. The dream of Isaiah 56 describes eunuchs as giving, quote, a place in the temple, an identity better than sons and daughters. Oh, look, an identity better than those binaries of boy or girl. But eunuchs will have something more. A eunuch being a gender minority in the ancient world. So the law exists, but Isaiah dreams more than that law. Why did Isaiah dream more? Because in the second half of Isaiah, this is after the people have lived in exile in Babylon, and they've experienced what it actually means to be a eunuch in the ancient world. And they don't want those people excluded anymore. They dream of a place where the eunuchs in the ancient world can find a home and a place, not treated like the way they're treated in Babylon. That's a dream of Isaiah. 
that is affirmed by Jesus. In Matthew 19, Jesus talks about those who are eunuchs from birth. That's interesting. Eunuchs from birth, those who were born with a different genital expression of their identity. And he speaks positively of, of them. In Acts 8, when the Ethiopian eunuch returns from the temple, where he would not have been welcome, he showed up, came out from Ethiopia, went to the temple, and they would not have let him in. He encounters Philip on the road who says there's nothing to prevent him from baptism. And what's fascinating is what he's reading, the section of Isaiah that talks about someone who has been cut off, the double entendre there, who no one respects, no one cares for. And he says to Philip, who's he talking about? Himself or someone else? Probably thinking, I think he's talking about me. And Philip says he is talking about you, but he's talking about Jesus who chose to share that experience for you so that you could be a part of God's people. The dream of Isaiah realized in the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. The real question that we need to ask ourselves is what will the church say to LGBTQIA plus persons? What's our message to them? What are we gonna say as Christians? Are we gonna say celibacy? The church has never enforced celibacy on a class of people. To say that someone has to be celibate for the rest of their life is cruel. Even Paul, even grumpy old Paul thought that. So clearly that can't be the answer. Also, they have to change, perhaps. Reparative therapy has been proven not just ineffective, but damaging and harmful. People cannot change who God created them to be. That's not what we do as Christians. Uh, so live a false life. Well, do your best living with someone uh, the same sex or living in a, an identity that's not your own. Um, odds are, if you're sitting there as a straight person and I said, okay, now you have to go marry someone of your same. You'd be like, I don't really think that's something I want to do. Or maybe you are. Maybe you're someone that, that is bisexual and that's lovely. But for someone that's really straight, that'd probably be a pretty bizarre thing to see. Or to say if someone that identifies as their gender as man, that they have to live their entire life as a woman, would be like, that I'm not who, that's not who I am. Asking people to live false lives is contrary to truth. We as Christians believe in truth and authenticity, walking in the light of people being who God created them to be, not asking them to spend their entire lives lying about who they are, right? Instead, I think the answer of the church to LGBTQIA plus Christians is this, live holy just as God created you. Know that as the psalmist says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made exactly as you are. Be in relationships where you can be authentic and true. Reject the values of this world, which see people as commodities to be used. Instead, seek lives of self-giving love and covenanted relationship with the person you choose to love and promise your life to. That, to me, is a message in the church that is actually consonant with the teachings of Jesus with the law of love of God and love of neighbor as we look at the Bible and scripture. And I think this is God's dream for creation. Uh, to set our hope in Christ drew from the epistle to the Ephesians as they described this dream. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. In the Episcopal Church, we believe God is reconciling a divided humanity through calls to love, justice, and service. This is God's dream for us, and we are called to make manifest that dream in our own lives. Before I close and have some final questions, uh, these are some resources I would encourage you to look at if you want to do some further reading. Scripture and discernment, make, discernment, decision making in the church, written in the 80s by Luke Timothy Johnson, former Benedictine monk, New Testament scholar at Emory University. He's the first one who made the argument that Acts 10 is the way through the question of, of same sex marriage in the church. Uh, Bened, former Benedictine Roman Catholic New Testament scholar, right? We didn't make that up as Episcopalian. Someone said that 20 years before we did. The Sutter Hope on Christ, which is our own document. A reasonable and holy engaging same sexualities. A friend of mine, actually, Tobias Stanner Holler, who's an Episcopal priest. This is a lovely book for digging through some of these questions really, really well. Tob Father Tobias does a wonderful job. And then a couple other books I draw you to. Uh, Embracing the Journey is a Christian Parent's Blueprint to Loving Your LGBTQ Child. I have not read this one yet, but the reviews I've heard is that it's a very, very helpful resource for parents. Similarly, Transforming the Bible and the Lives of Transgender Christians, another really good resource for really digging more deeply into some of these questions I've tried to bring to you tonight. So, did I actually time a class properly? Holy smokes, I did. Um, questions, comments, thoughts, things you're curious about?
If you're watching online, we do have about seven of you online. So feel free. If you want to put anything in the chat, I'll put this up here so I can see anything. I explain all perfectly. No questions. Well, I hope this is helpful. Um, this will be available um, on our church's Facebook page and also on our church's YouTube channel after we're done here. So if you want to go back and look at this, you can. Um, I'm also um, printing off a stack of these handouts. So if you want to take these handouts home with you, so you've got to look through them some more, um, you're welcome to do that as well. So, all right. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here online. I hope you have a lovely night. Um, and if you've got kids um, who you would like to learn more about this, I'm going to do this exact same thing next week for the kids. Um, so feel free to, to, to bring your kids, drop them off here at St. John's, sit with them if you'd like to, as we uh, run through all of these questions again. All right, that's the end. Now I got to figure out how to turn off this uh, Zoom show. On, so give me a second here. Stop share. Click to exit. Zoom. Stop share. Let me do it this way. There we go. Did that do it? Oh, not yet. And meeting for all.